Well, good morning, everyone. It really is lovely to be here worshipping the Lord with you today and to bring greetings from brothers and sisters in Monmouth. It's so good that we have connections with each other for the work of the gospel in this part of Wales um, and also connection with friends who preached and served with us. It was especially good, wasn't it, to share together in the Passion for Life mission in spite of all its challenges. And I remember that memorable prayer meeting of us gathering together to pray for the spread of the gospel uh, through that uh, occasion. I've also known your pastor since he was a teenager, so a very long time, um, from the days when he was still living at home in Bryn Arman, uh, and I was a student here in Wales. How wonderful is my Saviour's love for me, we've just sung. But the world is confused about love, isn't it? Not just recognizing or feeling love, but in society, love um, seems to be a subject that brings a lot of confusion. Perhaps one of the top areas for that today is that it's a word that's used to justify every expression of sexual fulfillment and pursuit or any kind of relationship. Love is love is the slogan. And if you've not come across it, our young people in school certainly will have done. It's one of five statements that have become part of a secular creed, we might say. And it's especially used to affirm gay relationships and cut any criticism of them. But it's wrong for a number of reasons. Firstly, there are lots of different kinds of love, aren't there? I do love pizza, but not in the same way in which I love my wife, perhaps. I did say perhaps. And uh, I love my wife, but not in the same way in which I love my children. Or any of them in the same way as I love playing the piano or watching a sunset. We get the point. Love is not love, is it? There are lots of different kinds. But more importantly, as Christians, we have something different to say, which we read in the scriptures this morning. To our confused world, we affirm that God is love, not that love is love. That he gives us glimpses of his love in all kinds of human relationships. And we're beginning our series, I understand, that this is the first exploring the character of God and this is perhaps one of the most difficult subjects because we could be here all day um, extolling the wonders of God's love. But we're going to explore it a little bit this morning. And I think that perhaps uh, this vast subject was summarized beautifully by the Swiss theologian Karl Barth. He had a brilliant mind. He wrote volumes of theology and he was once famously asked after a very impressive lecture that he had just given what the greatest thought was that had ever crossed his mind. Have you ever felt like that, asking you know, some of the brainiest people in the world what, what is the, the most sort of aloof and highest thought you've ever had? Anyway, he was asked this, and by this time he was an older man, and he paused for a while thinking, what is the greatest thought that's crossed my mind? And then he answered and said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. A brilliant theologian says that is the most uh, incredible and awesome thought that he had ever found had crossed his mind that Jesus should love him, and that the Bible makes this clear. And the Bible tells us that love comes from the very heart of God, reaching to you and me, from the love that's in God's own character, between the persons of the Godhead, that God in his being is love. This is a distinctively Christian thought because there are no other gods out there in any of the religions of the world that have a God who is love in his very nature. They have gods who might be loving in different ways, but what did God love before the world or universe was made? 
He was already a perfect being of love, the Father for the Son, the Son for the Father, and mutually one and another with the Holy Spirit. So God doesn't need you and me to be able to give and receive love. It's part of his nature. And theologians call this uh, a communicable attribute. Do you like fancy stuff like that? It means that we can actually experience and share in this love as opposed to some as other aspects of God's nature which are incommunicable, like he is all-powerful. He doesn't communicate that to us. None of us has all power, thankfully, or omniscience and omnipresence and things like that. Now, if there's one thing that most people know about God, if they have the faintest idea of him, it is that God is loving. In fact, there are surveys that demonstrate that. Uh, uh, usually in surveys, even in Britain today, uh, up to about half of those asked whether they think God is loving will say they do believe that he is loving. They'll have more doubts about whether he is all-powerful or things like that. But generically, there's this general sense that if there is a God, he ought to be loving and he would love us. In fact, it's little surprise to many people that God should love us because we feel that actually we're quite lovable. I'm okay, really. And it's not surprising that if there is a God in heaven, he would look down on me and he would love me because I am actually quite nice. Well, maybe I'm not that nice, but at least I'm not as bad as some other people. So it's me that he might love. And uh, he would pat on me on the head and pretty much agree with everything that I want to do. Love doesn't fill those sorts of people with wonder, surprise, or amazement that God should love me. And yet when we get closer to see the real God revealed to us in the scriptures and the person of Jesus, it begins to fill us with such wonder and amazement that we begin to ask the question, could God love me? Because once we get closer to the scriptures and to the truth, we realize actually we're not very lovable at all. We have all fallen short of God's glory. And this generic love for God's creatures in creation is not what we were made for, this general sense of feeling that God might be loving and out there somewhere. We were made to have a personal certainty of God's love for us. This character coming through from God's own heart, does it reach me? Does God love me? Does this part of his character reach me? After all, he is so great and powerful, we start to read in the Bible. Why would a supreme being, especially an all-knowing being, love me? Why would he be interested in me? Why would the one who puts stars and galaxies in space, the more of which we discover year by year with the advancements of our telescopes and satellites, he's designed the makeup of atoms and subatomic particles, and yet somehow or other we want to say he loves me. And we also know that we are not so great. If God had any inkling of what I was really like on the inside, not the face I show to others, but my thoughts, my words, there are some horrid things there, aren't there? Why would he love me? Heidi Joel puts, uh, a writer, she puts these two things together as she recalls a conversation she had with a uh, friend who had rejected the Christian faith. And her friend's argument was this. Do you know why I don't believe in your God? It's because of this. Why would the God of the universe die for us? We are just ants. We wouldn't die for an ant. So why would God? That lady had actually hit the nail on the head. Why would the God of the universe die for ants? To see ourselves as sinners and know we are loved like in that opening verse, God shows his love for us in this. While we were still bad, while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And this is why John, when he writes his letter, he writes wanting us to know 
God's love. In verse 15 and 16, we just have, uh, which was uh, read for us, uh, just to pick up on this again, he says, whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God, and we've come to know and believe the love God has for us. Look, we've come to know it and believe the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in God, uh, sorry, in love abides in God, and God abides in him. It's echoed in hymns, so many of them we could have chosen to sing today. To explore this character of God, therefore, this morning, um, and to perhaps make this vast subject, which is why does the ocean high as the heavens above and deep, yeah, uh, it's, it's a vast subject. Um, I'd like to draw just three points from this passage to help focus our thoughts this morning on this incredible aspect of God's character which permeates all the other aspects of who he is and what he does. We're going to look firstly at God's nature and how John describes him as God is love. Then we're going to take up the phrase of God's actions, this is love. John tells us how God's character is worked out and how we can actually see it. And then finally, his invitation, dwell in his love. So we're going to look at this aspect of God's character in those three ways. God is love, this is love, dwell in his love. And I hope that will help us this morning. The, the Christian writer uh, and pastor, A.W. Tozer, he once said, Nothing God ever does or did or will ever do is separate from the love of God. So when John comes and he says, God is love, he's not giving us a definition of God. He is describing God's love as permeating everything he is and does. His very essence is love. This means that God cannot help loving. It would be against his nature not to love. And it means that if God is loving as he reaches out to his creation, you and I can be drawn into and included in his love. So as we direct our thoughts on God and his love, we can't separate this from the fact that his love reaches out to us. Even God's judgment and anger is permeated with love. It's part of his love to judge what destroys love, sin. And because God's very nature is love, he has to show it and demonstrate it. It comes out of him. God's love is perfected and shown in three ways within his own being the source of love for his creation and world. And so when we say God is love, what we're saying is that God is eternally giving of himself for the benefit of others, mutually within his own being and towards his own creation. It's here, if we'd read a little, uh, sorry, where we read in verse 8, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. It's part of God's nature. Now, I've already touched on the fact that we could ask the question, when did God start becoming loving? We could ask other religions of the world this question. When did Allah begin to love his creation? And the answer would have to be when he made it. Because there was nothing to love until then. But the Bible has a different answer. It tells us that God was love before creation because it's in his nature. He is eternal, therefore his love is eternal. The gospel writers could see the significance of this. When Jesus prays to the Father in John 17, he speaks of the love the Father has for him before the foundation of the world. Before creation, there was love for the Father and the Son together. While on earth, we read that Jesus loves the Father and the Father loves the Son. 
each person seeking to bring joy and happiness to the other member of the Godhead. God is this perfect being, a world of love in himself. And so when we experience and share love one with another in our variety of ways, we are witnessing something, a glimpse of the heart of love of the Father for the Son and the Spirit together. To bring joy and happiness to each other is to reflect something that is godly. Now, I know this subject is a bit philosophical. We're talking about the nature, the character, the, the being of God. Now, uh, we, uh, and we should do that. It's good to stretch our minds a little bit from time to time like this. But I, I hope that it's also helping us to see how relevant this is to us. What is God's love like? What is his character like? It's an eternal love, I've mentioned already. It's a great love. Have you ever thought about that little word in the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world. He didn't just love the world, he so loved it because he is a being of pure and perfect love. His love is great and it's for the whole world. God greatly loved the world might be another way of translating that. It's beyond our minds, isn't it? That's why it's so good to have had that children's song because it's very wide and tall and deep and so on. It's more than our minds can necessarily grasp. It's inexhaustible love. It's never going to run out because it's generated within God's own being. And it's sovereign love. This is exciting. So many ways we could look at this. But it, it means God is free to love whoever or whatever he wants. It's uninfluenced by anything. So in Ephesians, when Paul thinks of this... Uh, listen to this application. He says that it was destined for us. He destined for you and me to know his love. In love, he chose us before the world was founded. God doesn't love us, therefore, because we are lovable or nice or at least not as bad as everyone else. He doesn't love us because we deserve it or earn it. He just loves us because he has chosen to love us. It is an act of his will to choose and love whoever he wants. And if you are chosen and loved in Jesus, there is nothing that can separate us from that. God knows everything about you and he loves you anyway. There's nothing we can do to make him change his mind in terms of being good or bad. So this first thought that John takes, he, he draws our attention to the character of God of being love in his very being. We could unpack that more another time perhaps and maybe in the book that you're being encouraged to read over the summer. But let's move to think about how do we actually get to know this love, to see it in action. And John tells us this very clearly. He says, this is love. And uh, when he, he says this in verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. How did God show his love? He showed it in the cross of Jesus, where Jesus turned away God's wrath, and judgment of our sin, he took it on himself on the cross so that we could be free to experience God's love in all its fullness. At the cross, he takes the barrier away, and there we now have nothing but love to experience from God. This is how God has shown his love, by giving Jesus to rescue us. He defines what love looks like. And he says, it looks like this. It looks like my son dying on a cross, taking the blame for you. It is selfless, sacrificial, and in our case, undeserving. In fact, where do we see descriptions of God's love in the Bible? Aren't they almost always connected with the cross? 
not creation. So when we meet the person on the street who says, oh yes, uh, God's loving and I, I, I feel close to God and uh, his love when I'm in a, uh, going for a walk in the countryside or whatever, the Bible doesn't say we experience God's love through his creation. That's why we have a confused world about love. Because creation, as it's fallen, also has some horrid things in it as well. Yes, the countryside is beautiful. Sunsets are lovely. But there are also earthquakes as well as beautiful sunsets, aren't there? There is cancer as well as health. The world's idea of love is fuzzy because it only experiences it through creation and a fallen world. Unless Jesus is involved, love is lacking. So it was the Father's plan, the Son's will, and the Spirit's application to point us to love in action at the cross where God reaches out to undeserving sinners and makes it possible for us to know him. It's always the cross. This is love. I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Love and giving. 1 John 4 verse 10 here, this is love, not our love, but God's love for us in sending Jesus to propitiate, expiate, remove our sins, turning away God's judgment from us. Revelation chapter 1, to him who loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood. I've made the point, I hope. Augustine uh, from a former era, one of the early church fathers said, the cross is a pulpit from which Christ preached God's love to the world. And the message is, God does not love us because we are lovable or because we deserve his love. He just loves us and has sent his son to save us. So the cross reveals God's love in action. When I was growing up, there was a, a very uh, well-known series of adverts. Uh, and uh, among them uh, were the adverts for Interflora. And at that time, the slogan was, say it with flowers. Glad some of you remember that advert as well. Say it with flowers. In other words, action. Um, there were also chocolate adverts which were, would encourage you, <clears throat> that if you wanted to say thank you to someone, it's these particular brand of chocolates that you need uh, in order to do that. In other words, to show love, you need your flowers and chocolates, and a generation of men grew up thinking that was uh, the best way to cover up anything wrong you'd done as well. But um, flowers, chocolates, whatever it is, showing in action, not just with words. But the cross, more beautifully and powerfully, tells us that God doesn't just say he loves us, he shows it. He gives himself, he sacrifices his life for us. And in the Bible story of God's love from beginning to end and our constant rejection and resistance to it, it tells us of this love story of God pursuing his people, coming after them even when they wander away. This is love of another kind. Again, when I was growing up uh, in the 1980s, there was a song uh, given that name, Love of Another Kind. In the Old Testament, it's called Hesed. It means committed or covenant love. In the New Testament, Agape, a unique kind of love that loves regardless. And it's embodied um, in this song. Amy Grant, she, she sang it, it was called uh, the words go like this, they say love is cruel, they say love is fragile, but I found in you a love of another kind. They say love brings hurt, I say love brings healing, understanding first, it's a love of another kind. The love I know is a love so few discover, they need to know Jesus' love is like no other. See, Jesus' love is like that. At the cross, it was while we were sinners Christ died for us. He reaches out to you and me in love, choosing love, choosing to love, even when we don't deserve it. And it's this love which perhaps in our society is uh, pictured maybe most fully in the words of commitment 
and promise that a bride and a groom make to each other. When they get married, traditionally we would say that they say, I do. I do actually comes more from American uh, style services. Um, I'm not going to test you now to ask any husbands and wives out there what you actually said. Um, I'll tell you, you said, I will. And the essence of the wedding service is when your partner, your spouse, when they are wonderful and lovely, will you love them? And the answer is yes, in health, in good times. And what about when they are unlovely, in sickness, or when things are difficult or poor? And the answer is, I will. Not I feel, not even that I do in this moment, it's I will. That is biblical love embodied in the wedding service. Biblical love says, I will love even when you're not lovely. That's what holds marriages together. Saying, when things are not good, I will love because that's what God's love is like at the cross. When I was a sinner, when I was unlovely, Christ died for me. I will, says God. And Jesus in the garden says, your will be done. Now, uh, we've looked briefly this morning at God's love. Uh, God is love in his being and nature, his character. He demonstrates it most clearly and fully at the cross. And if any of us wonder if we are loved, are you feeling rejected this morning? Are you wondering if you're loved? Do you think that no one cares about you? Look at the cross. Look at Jesus. He loves you. The cross preaches to the world the love of God in Christ for sinners. You don't need to doubt whether God will love accept you uh, if you come to the cross. And that brings us to this third point that John makes as he's exploring this theme, is the invitation, dwell in his love or live in his love. I have to say, I do prefer dwell, don't you? Dwell sounds a lot more permanent and enjoyable. Uh, it's a place where uh, you, you go places when you're dwelling, don't you? You um, dwell in his love means you live in it, you work in it, you serve in it. So when someone comes to the cross and they belong to Jesus and they, they, they open their heart to him, the Christian can say, God loves me because he loves his son. And I belong to his son. When he looks at me, he sees Jesus, not Jonathan now. So I have no doubt about God's love for me because there's never going to be anything that stops the father loving the son. So if I belong to him, then nothing will sever his love from me. This is so different to the world's idea of love or progressive liberal Christianity, which says God just loves everyone and everyone's going to heaven in the end. It's in Jesus that we are loved. It's in Jesus that we're rescued. It's in Jesus that God loves us with a saving personal love. And John says, will you dwell in his love this morning? Is that where you are? Dwelling in God's love. To me, that means it's like a precious jewel in some ways that I'm going to think about and look at and take up and turn around and think about. It means that I'm going to, uh, wherever I go, I'm taking this love with me. We're invited to live in it. We can say no to God's love and we can distort his love. But John is inviting us here to live in it. The love that we see defined in God's own being, demonstrated at the cross itself, is the love that we live in. And that's why John says, you can't really say you love God or know his love unless you love each other. Because if his love is in you, it will come out. It will, will show to the rest of the world. We can't be a church without love. I heard someone once say that if we really are a loving church that has something of God's love, we will have 
at least one meaningful contact with a brother or sister from the church outside of our Sunday service, apart from it, in the week. If God's love is in our heart, especially towards his children, do we think of one another in that way? Will we connect with each other? Do we have fellowship or prayer or meet up or encourage or phone or write or whatever it might be? Church is a community of love because the God who called it into being is a community of love. We're a community of sacrificial love because the God who called the church into being is a God of sacrificial love who showed it at the cross. We can't have Christian service without love, says the Apostle Paul, because it's just service and duty if we don't have the love of Jesus in our service. We can slip into that in our church life, can't we, where things become duty and routine. We can't have real mission without love because it was love which prompted God to so love the world and send his son. So this love will reach out to a lost world. We don't have the love of God if we have no heart for a lost world. So John's exploration here of the character of God has some vast applications for us. If God in his nature is love and he has shown it at the cross, he is inviting us to experience it and sending us to show it. And this morning, I have to ask you, therefore, are you someone who knows the love of God in Jesus? Do you know that you're accepted by him because of the cross? That you're loved by him because of the cross? Not performance, not your Bible reading and daily uh, readings, not your Bible knowledge and memory verses, not your deep and spiritual prayer life, you are just loved because if you've come to the cross, it is there that you're saved. I hope that you do memorize Bible verses, read your Bible and pray daily, and that you do that because you love the God who first loved you. But this morning, come to Jesus if you haven't done that. Experience his love shown at the cross and know that you are safe in his love forever. Then secondly, if you do belong to Jesus and you have this assurance of his love, are you sharing it with your brothers and sisters in the church? That's John's application of this passage. He's not interested in philosophy. He's interested in community, about brothers and sisters bearing with one another, forgiving, giving themselves for each other. And then th third, thirdly, are we showing and sharing that love with the world? not just with our actions, but our words, to make Jesus the King of love known. That's my prayer for Cornerstone Church. It's my prayer for Monmouth Baptist, for all gospel churches, that we really will look more and more like the God who has brought us into being. So shall I lead us in a prayer for a moment, just to reflect on the love of God that's ours. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Lord, we want to thank you, O loving Heavenly Father, for drawing us with your everlasting love. Thank you, Lord, that when we get it right and when we get it wrong, your love at the cross is always the same. So we'd like to come to that place this morning and stay there, staying at the foot of the cross, knowing that you have paid the price for us in your son Jesus and knowing the empowering, the inner power of your very loving presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's anyone there this, here this morning who is unsure of whether they are loved by you, lift their eyes to the cross to see Jesus afresh away from themselves until they see what you have done 
And Lord, for us, those of us who perhaps uh, found that it's become ordinary and every day, we've become complacent about your love. Help us to be thrilled again that you should accept and love us in him. And Lord, I pray for the church here and ask that love will characterize their work and life together, their worship and witness to our loveless, confused world today. Thank you that we can affirm God is love. Amen.